Okay, he goes, well, I can't resist uh, some of these numbers to kick things off. And I, I don't surgery. think our guest will, is aware that we'll do, we just start with their numbers, yeah. um, but here are some numbers. Okay. 103 tests, over 8,500 runs, 30 tonnes, 2950s, average of 50.7 clean, mm. uh, highest ever test score in Australian history, 380, 161 ODI, 6,000 ODI runs, <laughs> average nearly 45, highest of 181 not out. 10 tons, 36 fifties, 24,603 first class runs, oh. 79 tons. So just hated runs. Yeah. Uh, this bloke. But um, it's with <laughs> it's with pleasure and it's our privilege to introduce Matthew Lawrence Hayden onto the show, or as our wiki says, Haydos or Unit. Uh Haydos. <laughs> unit. Yeah. How are you? you know, unit Unit was uh was my valley days, you know. Okay. They used to call me fridge and my brother freezer. <laughs> when when he when he dropped out of the game, I just became the unit. <laughs> you gotta love those early doors. I just, I just love how uh, how we turn you know a situation around to find a nickname. Out of, gosh, it's just so Australian, and long may it bloody will continue as yeah. well. Oh, of course. Well, speaking of early days, Haydos, so, uh, tell us about your relationship to grade cricket. Like, did you spend much time there before going on to uh, score all the runs that I just mentioned there? Yeah, look, um, Bally's Cricket was my only club. Um, I say that very pr- proudly and very candidly as well because, I mean, during the time when you kind of got offers from everyone, I love the fact that I started and stayed with the one club, the one state, uh, the one franchise within competitions, and you can't exactly move to be a Kiwi because that would mean death by a thousand cuts. Um, <laughs> so the one country as well. Um, but great cricket was a was a was a great learning curve for me. Um, I feel that the balance also was so good because you you had guys like um, Brett Henschel, for example, um, former you know, Queensland um, cricketer, Michael Ephraim, who came from Victoria, you know, moved up to Queensland, um, and then you got the great, you know, guys like Kepler Wessels, AB. I mean, if you couldn't learn in that environment, you you were either stupid or didn't want to. So it was just brilliant for me to just be in that environment, say nothing, sit in the corner, you know, say, yeah, I'll have a beer, I'll stay a bit longer um, and just listen. And it was superb because a lot of those guys that I just mentioned, you start to move up the ranks and suddenly you've got a, a maroon cap on as well and you start playing at, at, at another level. Um, but the same principles apply. Um, so great foundation um, place for me uh, at Valley's Cricket Club. It was right next to my school. I was I was going to Morris College as a boarder there in my final two years of school for the bush. Didn't want to go, fellas, by the way. Just <laughs> kicking and screaming. I love the bush. I could see myself doing nothing other than sitting on a tractor, planting, harvesting, um, tending to like, you know, the paddocks in whatever way, tending to a couple of sheep or cattle that we ran. But, you know, mum really just said, Matty, this, not going to be enough you know here the, the land is growing up and sadly that also meant the same for my brother as well um and so dad and mum still you know live out the property but i came coastal way and have never looked back just completely love you know living where we are here in the southeast corner well you obviously have to do a uh, i'd imagine a 15 to 20 year you know great cricket apprenticeship before you got your shot finally playing for queensland <laughs> um but I, I wonder um i mean is it is it true that before your first innings for queensland you asked someone if you if anyone had ever hit a 200 on debut yeah i was an arrogant prick just say it and and how just many and how many did on. you score on debut <laughs> uh less than that so i failed yeah well, unfortunately for the listeners out there he scored 149 <laughs> <laughs> I'd say what I did learn out of that, though. I learned that not to be an absolute pillock because that was right, the first innings. And I, and I, it was a throwaway line um, mm. around that, but I genuinely felt that I'd been waiting that long in the wings to play for Queensland mm. that I was so confident that I wasn't going to be happy with a half score, you know, a 30. I mean, I copped so much black over that comment mm. um, over the years, but... Now, the reality of it is I, I just felt like I'd paid my dues and it wouldn't matter whether it was South Australia that I came up against to make my debut or, or England. Um, I was ready uh, and I was ready to play really good cricket and what I probably wasn't ready for is the level of professionalism and I can remember in the second innings I probably learned my greatest lesson in my debut match because it wasn't 149 even though it did give me confidence. The lesson was that Never take on board 
your sponsor being Big Red. It was a, it was a full strength uh, powers brewery at the time, bitter that we were sponsored by, and we had a, a function at the uh, one of those things, the Stafford Tavern, um, and I'd had way too much in celebration of my debut innings, and I came home, met my brother, who was my training partner as well, and five year elder. And I was off my choppers midway through a game, and he said, "Mate, I don't have double sh- shoulder reconstructions for you to get on the piss midway through a game." <laughs> and so, if you look at the, um, if you look at, you ever do that again, basically, and I'll never ever throw another ball to you again in anger. Um, but if you look at the second innings, I got nothing. You know, maybe I don't know less than twenty, anyway. And I, and from that day, I always treated the game with the utmost respect. Mm. You know, there was never a time when I just put the put the foot off the throttle. If I had a competitive advantage, I'd definitely drive it in. I just mm. thought if you're going to get a good score, make it a dirty, big, fat one. Mm. <laughs> um, but don't take the ground, the ground, the, and the game, and the and your colleagues and your mates for granted mm. because, geez, it's a fine line you walk on when it comes to success and failure in, in any sport, let alone professional sport. Hey, Doss, uh, it's, it's funny you say that, like, as you're sort of putting full throttle down on your big yeah. diesel engine on the road. Cause, cause, yeah, cause, big mean Mahindra XUV 500, yep. <laughs> well, as thirsty no, as a camel, this one, 2.2 turbo diesel. It sucks it up. Man, I never had a Bowser. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's amazing you say that because when I think of you, like I just think about like quintessential Australian masculinity mm. at the turn of the century, you know, like mm. a big smiling Queensland man, enormous chest, mm. you know, pipes, training singlet, benching plenty probably, loving the beach, you know, gentle off the field, playing hard on it, getting on the front dog, mm. you know, as you, mm. every, everything in front of square. You know, like you once yeah. said, I'm as much I'm as much of an Iron Man as I was a cricketer. Uh, like this, this was the blueprint, like for our sporting success. Now it's all sort of like F45, yoga, skin regimes, veganism. Yeah. Like, did do you think there's a relationship between the softening of the Australian male and the diminishing sporting success? And do we need to go back to the Hayden style of the front dog, chest, pipes, etc., to just recapture that form of glory? You know, it's interesting. I, I had a really Good conversation with Adam Goods in one of the episodes of this year. As a cricketer, we always looked at the AFL model as being an epitomising professionalism in sport. You know, at the time when lines, you know, came to the to the Gabba, every Thursday night there was us training late to the evening, sometimes till about eight o'clock, eight thirty. A lot of guys were dropping and running from work. Um, guys like Paul Jackson, for example, who by day was a bookworm and full-time accountant and by night used to visit um, As Malcolm Frankie, a great cricketer in club cricket, used to turn him on ice, but but not. He didn't turn him at all, Jacko. Um, mm. But, you know, we, we train and then, you know, that was the night of the Gabba Greyhounds and we were sponsored by Forex the majority of the time that I was playing as a junior in, in um, state cricket. And the happiest days in our life was when the Benson and Hedges ticks used to rock up with the, the full weight special filter uh, boxes who were the sponsor of us and, and 4X cabinets were full of, of beautiful bitter. Um, and we just used to punt on the, on the dogs as they go around. In those days, you had to walk across the dog track to, to get to the gather. So it was like a rite of passage. Mm, yeah. um, but then you look over to the sort of southeast you know, where the old cricketers club used to be and there was the line and you'd see one player being followed around like a dog on heat with someone else that was kind of in and around in and around the setup, um, high performance team, taking skin folds and making sure they were hydrated and they had all their meals set out for them. So, you know, someone like Goodsy, I think, was looking the other way going, mate, how good are these professional cricketers? Not only are they getting paid more, <laughs> But they have to do stuff all as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the joke was on us. And the first time I saw the King, Shane Moore, you know, was was um, a game against Victoria. Um, first year, it had been pissing down with rain overnight. And Merv had obviously made the call early doors to, to have a big one because it just looked like we are going to get rained out. Um, and, so, and so that's what happened. 
Um, we didn't get rained out, though. He opened the curtains in the morning and it was bright blue sunshine as it often is up here in Queensland the night after a massive storm. <laughs> and, of course, it was green as they warned him to play. He was 12th man. And we won the toss and batted stupidly on a green top, as always we used to do that. <laughs> and I turned to Trevor Barsby as we were walking across the dog track and I was walking behind him that looked not dissimilar, actually, to, to those slipstreams, you know, when they when they're trying to put a new vehicle through its paces and they blow smoke over a fan and they get the strip stream, slip stream, they get that, that beautiful photo of yeah. you know, how aerodynamic they are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm walking behind Trevor Barsby, just, you know, nervously <laughs> puffing away in his cigarette and I'm his slip stream. And then we, I say to him, mate, is that, isn't that that Shane Warne? Like, he's supposed to be, like, the next big thing. And he went, yeah, that's funny. I said, well, mate, he's got it right. He's big. <laughs> but he was, he, was, he was chopping away on, he had a pie and a cigarette in the same hand and he had a Coke in the other hand and he was just trading blows, you know, like, I mean, he was that happy because he wasn't playing because he was so hungover. But yeah, that's, that's what cricket was sort of like, that was the culture. You play hard yeah. and you also play hard. <laughs> um, so, you know, that turned around, you know, through the sort of early um, 90s into the mid-90s where it became a lot more measured and a lot more people kind of like, you know, taking pulses and, and looking after you. Um, dietitians, for example, were the first were the first sort of professional staff member that, outside of physio because you didn't tool with a doctor or mm. or anything. You just had a physio and um, and a manager who was often a board director. And I'm, I remember the first time he, um, this physiotherapist, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, food specialist came in, dietitian came in and was giving this great lecture on, you know, a bit of this and a bit of that protein, this amount of carbohydrate. And says, oh, Miss, I've got a question, yeah. And um, she says, oh, what's that, Miss? She says, pizza. I just want to know if pizza's any good. And she said, yeah, I'll you know, you choose the right pizza, it really depends on the topping because you've got the carbohydrate and the base, you've got cheese, you know, which which is those essential fats and you've got the toppings. As long as you don't go too hard on it uh, and you don't eat too much of it, um, you should be okay. And she said, but, you know, just tell me, like, you know, how many pizzas, you know, would you often have? And Merv, as quick as, he just says, it depends how many pizzas they cut it up into. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what an athlete. This is just, what and an this athlete. is our premium fast bowler, yeah. legendary Merv Hughes, that had just done it all in the game, was right in the throes of his career. Um, and and this is the sort of, you know, expectation that your young bowlers like a Brett Lee or a mm. Michael Kastowicz, mm. you know, Glenn McGrath even, you know, they were brought up, bring up through this model, but you know, they, they had to set their own tone and, and, and realise that food was fuel. And, mm. and that's what I speak to Goodie about the podcast as well. I've got to ask you, Doss, about the, obviously the 380. Have to ask about it. Zimbabwe, you know, over there at Perth. I mean, I want to know, like some days you just have a day out, don't you? But, I mean, at what point did you think, like, I'm going big today? Like, were you on about 20 or, you know, was it in the warm-ups or was it when you saw the lineup announced for Zimbabwe? Mm. I mean, some of these sixes you're hitting down the ground off Heath Streak, mm. poor old Heath Streak. I mean, just absolutely yeah. front-dogging. I mean, yeah. it's the epitome of alphadom in Australia yeah. cricket. I've never felt safer in my entire life when Matthew Hayden is front-dogging and hitting Heath Street back down the ground for 380 <laughs> test runs. Yeah, well, it's probably fortunate I was actually even playing because it's another example of how, you know, times have changed where now the physio and the trainers, they have full say on whether you're going to participate in the game. Um, you know, whereas in our day... Mm. And this is the situation. Like we'd had eight weeks where we'd had you know, time off. It was a very early season game in Perth. And we got over there really early. I've, I've been over at Stratty for a large part of that, just doing my own personal training with one of the fitness trainers at Australian Cricket, Jock, mm. Jock Campbell. Mm. And we'd surf and run sand hills, do weights, and you know, where I met, basically. We were so fit. But we couldn't hit a cricket ball in anger. So when we got over there, I was smashing me and cricket balls in the nets. And they're a bit of razzle-dazzle, those nets over in Perth as well. Um, but I did my back in and, and did it in properly as well, like a day before the game. And the morning of the game, I was in serious doubt. And the 
physio at the time, Errol Walcott, said to me, mate, you can't play. And I said, oh, I don't think so, Errol. <laughs> I said, uh, mate, my job is to tell you that I can play and your job is to keep me on the park. So, and this is not, these weren't words that, you know, were unknown, meaning that his job, and he knew it, was to just keep me on the park no matter what. And so it was really by necessity that I had to bat the way that I did because I actually couldn't move. So rather than running, I thought, well, the best route surely is aerial. <laughs> um, and so pretty much from the get-go, staying still and hitting through the line of the ball and that probably what is now considered to be just a hitting technique rather than, you know, a way to play, um, worked. Yeah. I mean, I can't really remember in those 11 hours apart from when I got out, miss hitting a ball. It's just everything was just coming out of the middle. So oh, as they say... Every, as they say in fly fishing, you know, don't never change the fly. Um, so it just worked, and and it, I suppose you know that that really continued to work as a hitting technique for me right through as we mm. transitioned transitioned into one day cricket and, mm. and T Twenty cricket as well. Um, became an important um, weapon mm. um, for me personally through those different genres of the game. Uh-huh. Mate, speaking of weapons, uh, your great mate Justin Langer is famously quoted as saying recently as Australian coach, uh, you know, everyone talks about this word sledging, but there's a difference between banter and abuse. Abuse is no good, but there's plenty of room for banter. Banter. Um, so many people are keen to know more about the Australian cordon, you know, during your era. Oof. So just with that in mind, I was hoping you could give us an insight into the banter style of each. Like I'll, I'll say a name and maybe you could give a, a, a few words on the style of, of, of each of their banter. So if I sort of said Gilch- yeah. Gilchrist, just a couple of words. Uh, hyena on the uh, hyena on the plains of Africa. <laughs> he'd, just, he'd, he'd chip he'd chip, a, chip around the line, you know, to, to get whatever he could, ah. and then he'd back he'd back away, back down. Oh, that's <laughs> I got a couple more. So, Warren. Yeah. Uh, well, let's just say he was one of the big fish. Um, so I would just say big fish. Yeah, he's, okay. he's a top line predator. He's, he's a pelagic man. He's, he's top of the food chain. This is so vivid. Good. Uh, early days when you were there, AB? Mm. Uh, I, I would say he's more gladiatorial. Like I'm sort of, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, what's the word when, you, when you're thinking about someone like, you know, the gladiator where he's just, he was so, for such a tiny man, I mean, he was ridiculously small. He was just like a pit bull. There you go. That's probably a better. He's, oh. a, he's a pit bull. Once he got you, he'd never let you go. A couple more. Uh, Tugger? Uh, hmm. Tugger was like a wizard sleeve. Um, <laughs> he, he just sort of he'd pull a prediction out of the hat like, You'd go to him in the huddle after sort of being one or two down in, a, in the final innings of a test match, and he'd say, "Boys, uh, just make sure those beers are on ice at seat time because um, <laughs> we're definitely winning." And we're all looking at going, mate. They're one or two down, and you know, Hansi Cronje is like smashing one on 120, and you're going, um, "Where's he get that from?" Sure enough, the ball before tea, the wizard sleeve just opens up and out puffs the sort of other eight wickets that you needed to get to that stage. And bingo, off you went. Two more. Uh, junior? Oh, junior, junior was a pretty nice bloke. Like, he'd, he'd say everything that, he'd say everything that uh, uh, was just what everyone else was thinking. Okay. So if he was rubbish, you'd go, mate, yeah, it's rubbish. <laughs> and you think, actually, no. And actually, the funny thing about junior sledge is that and the funny thing is that the person that was receiving Junior's sledge, who would inevitably worship Mark Wall, because there hasn't been a finer cricketer that's maybe great to the planet, let alone Australia, mm. would go, oh, yeah, that's probably a fair point, Mark. Actually, I am rubbish. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and finally, Hayden, Doss. You know. The Doss... Uh, I don't know. Like when I was batting, I reckon I was a lot more aggressive. Like when when Shaw Bakhtar, for example, was running in, yeah. um, I, I'd just I'd think of 
ways to really piss a fast bowler off, which is not hard, right? The moment you start showing anywhere near your spricks as you're walking towards them, there's pretty much evidence that you're going to get a bouncer. So mm-hmm. I just sort of play that card that, yeah. you know, someone like Actor, for example, I'd call him B-grade Actor for a start, which um, <laughs> which used to get under his skin a bit. I'm sure. Um, but I'd also like to sort of leverage as well, like play the political role. Like when we were playing in Sharjah and it was 58 degrees out oh, yeah. in the middle. And Akhtar, when we walked out, said, I'm going to kill you today in a whole lot more colourful language. And I said, mate, that's terrific, you know. I'm looking forward to that challenge in a lot more <laughs> colourful language. I said, but here's the thing, Jumbo. I said, you got, you got 18 balls to do it. You've got three overs because you're going to turn into a marshmallow that's been left on the flame too long and it's going to be dripping down it. And I'm going to be the one at the other end of those 18 balls that's going to be mopping it up. <laughs> So, of course... <laughs> just two blokes having a chat. Hey, this, this is a half an hour story, right? But I'm just going to get to the nutshell. So, so I had Venkat, you know, the, 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 yeah, yeah. the Austin from, from Chennai mm. um, at the other end. So, I've now got a point of leverage. So, I go, <laughs> right, how can I get show up looking like an absolute goose? And how can I tell Venkat about this? Now, India and Pakistan, there's no loss of love there mm. for a start. So I thought, that's my point. So as Shaab's running into bowl and he's cursing every profanity under the sun uh, at me, I get to his bowling mark as I'm counting down his balls from 1 to 18. So it's like, <laughs> this is ball number 9, for example. Yeah. He gets to his delivery stride and I pull out. I count the ball. He runs at me going, what the problem is? And I said, i got a problem, Venkat. I storm up to Venkat. I said, look, mate, I give everything on the game. right? I, I, I deserve everything I get, but Within the protocols of etiquette of the game, surely you can't be running in and abusing someone. And so Venkat goes, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and uh, he, he tunes him all the way back to his bowling mark, which is a mile, yeah. like it's right back at the sight screen. Yeah, yeah. And I think the only way that Shoaib is going to get me out here is bold because Venkat's definitely not going to give me LB. And... <laughs> And that's not going to get caught beyond that because this thing was an absolute bounce and burner. It wasn't bouncing more than a centimetre. So all I had to do was just stand the ground, and that was it. He got through his 18 overs. He collapsed, seriously collapsed at the end of it. And, of course, I take the opportunity to get my gloves, which I didn't need, and just go up to um, go up to show up and said, you want to go off, don't you? And he, and he says, no, I said, mate, come on. There's no heroes in test cricket. David Boone once said that to me. It's hot, and I know you're busted. Just go off. I won't. I promise you, I won't think any worse of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's called. He's called our mate on, and he's gone off, and he didn't participate in the rest of the test match. He was heat struck. So that's a sort of mine was sort of like more of a not so much words, but just. I don't know. I just used to love that confrontation anyway. I think all of the Australian cricket team did, frankly. Yeah. Uh, just finally, mate, notice you've been getting around the digital space a lot more, you know, some Instagram live, cooking with your, your girls, uh, you know, a recent rendition of True Blue. Can't get enough of that. Um, mm. you got a you got a podcast out now at the ABC called Dishy, goes beyond cricket, stories that your guests associate with the food they've eaten. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, uh, so I'm not that bright. Cricketers aren't. Um, so yeah, it's about food, but it's it's talking to great Australians through the through the lens of food, you know. And we've had a couple of beauties, Surya Pitt, for example. You know, I reckon is probably the, the toughest woman in in Australia. Yeah. She talks about her early childhood, talks about you know what sustained her through a through a through a training, but also through a life. Um, so it's really delving into a pickpocketing, if you like, um, a bit like Adam Gilchrist, as I was saying, um, pickpocketing those great stories that come out the back of experiences that they've, these superstars have had, you know, like a Justin Langer or a Kurt Pangeli, uh, Lane Beachley, Adam Good, through the lens of food, um, through different phases of their life. Boys, it's been so much fun doing. I mean, you blokes know how much I love food mm. um, and how big a part it's had in my life as well um, from a from a fuel point of view, but it's also sustained so many memories. Who doesn't, right? You know, Christmas time, what are you doing? Well, you eat. Well, what are you eating? Okay. What's your earliest memories? What's mum look like? Like JL, for example, he was telling the story about his grandma 
about how the 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 sandwich that she made him was the best in the whole world, and it was three ingredients: a truckload of butter, some pickle, and some cheese. And those those words of "Oh, darling, you know you'll work it off as you run around the block." I'm sure you know. <laughs> even though he was three inches tall and probably couldn't afford to put on any weight. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, he, you know, just, that, that's the sort of, that's what this podcast is all about. So just getting behind individuals that um, and stories uh, as they've gone through different phases of their life, some of triumph. Like Kirk, for example, you imagine, you know, he would be an expert on, on Suvalakis after playing a function and not, not finishing up until 2 o'clock and having adrenaline. He tells a great story. I think we're in, in Norway where he, he went into this little restaurant about 4 o'clock in the morning, old-style uh, decor, claiming to have a pot that had been brewing this special soup for not three years, not even three days, 300 years. We're talking about some sort of extreme Viking mushroom trip that must have been happening, I reckon. <laughs> not a great story. You know, who would have ever thought, you know, as much as we know him from MasterChef and obviously in excess, that he's got this great repertoire of different dishes that he, that he savours and shares with, with Lady, who's an absolute legend as well. So, yeah, lots of fun, boys. It's podcast is something that, well, you guys are doing one right now. You get a real insight into, you know, people through expanded yeah. conversations as opposed to sound bites and feeling under the pressure about, you know, what you're delivering. Yeah, nice one. I'm sure plenty of people love to uh, listen to you more. Hey, Doss, uh, it's called Dishy. It's on ABC. And can I just say, normally we sign off with something quite formal and just say thanks, but I I actually wasn't expecting this conversation. Like, I, I had one view of, like, the way you might have sledged, Hey, Doss, heading into this conversation, and now I just think I would love to be sledged by you at all times. I've n- I don't think we've spoken to anyone more colourful or vivid in the mm. way they've described things before. So thanks so much uh, for the conversation. All from a guy called Unit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's quite easy to bullshit bullshitters, isn't it? So um, <laughs> on, that, <laughs> on that note, signing, signing off. <laughs> thanks, boys. I look forward to you uh, following the podcast. So, yeah. Th- thanks, Hayden. I appreciate mate. it, mate. Thanks so much, mate.